so without further ado, uh, I guess if Ellie and Dave want to uh, introduce themselves and then uh, we'll, we'll start the, uh, the presentation proper. Yeah, go on, I'll go first. As you can see, you're a bit shy there. You're on mute as well, by the way, Ellie, just so you know. Um, so yeah, uh, so Ellie and I are old friends um, from, from way back when. Um, and we, we're both from Huddersfield, sort of. I'm not really, but you know, I am. Um, You're not. <laughs> <laughs> Um, but yeah, we 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 uh, we did some some work together. We're both into the circus, both into juggling, um, and we were both on the sort of same side of the world together at one point. I was living in Indonesia, and Ellie was in India. And Ellie rang me up one day and said, "I'm not ready to go back to England. What adventures have you got planned?" Uh, so yeah, over the course of about a week we formulated a plan i'd already had the idea of cycling back home from indonesia but i didn't want to do it alone and ellie's uh, phone call came at pretty much the right time for me do you want to add anything uh not really i i just i don't know got a bit spontaneous never done anything like it before in my life so uh why the hell not yeah yeah that's an important point actually that I'd done a couple of bicycle rides before, but Ellie had done nothing. You know, this was her first, first like, you did a bit in Ireland, didn't you? Was it a week maybe in Ireland? I did like five days in Wales. Bah, close enough, a week in Ireland, five <laughs> days in Wales. And we didn't make it, so we had to get the train at the last bit, so. <laughs> yeah, like so from, from nothing to full on. Yeah, so that's the introduction, short and sweet. So let's, um, it's been a few weeks since I've used Zoom, so let me just get on with this. All right, can everybody see the screen there? Yes. Yeah, that's looking good. All right, let me just hide these. Oh, how do I do this? Yeah, there we go. Okay, so this is our Instagram site and the blog, which is still not finished. It ends abruptly in... Holland, I think, or Belgium, around there. Close to the end. Yeah, close enough to the end. Um, so this is the route we took. Um, we did set off originally from from Java, about here, um, and we cycled up more or less through Sumatra and Java and then crossed over to Malaysia. We stayed there. We intended to stay there for a week to get our visa for China sorted out and ended up staying for two and a half years because we loved it so much. Um, so we, tend, we do tell people that we cycled from Malaysia, not Indonesia, but we did do this little bit here, not taking anything away. Um, so yeah, um, what to say about the route? Uh, I'm going to cover uh, certain things in, in the route later on, so just so you can get a visual reference of what we did. Yeah, so 21 countries altogether including Malaysia and uh, the UK and it's about I, that's a little typo actually it's between 17,500 kilometers around about there I've given ourselves a cheeky little kilometer that's from when we got lost I guess no, it's 17 it's that's right is it yeah oh great yeah. I'm the one with I was the one with the computer yeah Ellie was the <laughs> organizer <laughs> I just went along and fixed things when they broke <laughs> Ellie was the brains of the mission. <laughs> All right, so I'm going to talk. This is going to be mostly based about like tips, really. It's not going to be like what we did, you know. It's more for people who are wanting to do it because if you want to know what we did, go onto the Instagram, go onto the onto the blog. Um, <clears throat> so uh, the passport. We decided to come across here over the Caspian Sea. Um, because we wanted to go through Iran, actually, which is a bit of a shame because on the British passport, it's actually quite difficult and, and can become quite expensive to cross Iran. Um, what was it? It was British and US and Canadian passports. Yeah. Um, they make it a bit difficult for those passports to enter Iran. Everyone so took, else, it's very easy. Mm -hmm. Yeah. 
Yeah, so we took um, a slightly different route, um, but it's also a very common route for cycle tourists. Um, there's a famous highway uh, here called the Pamir Highway, which goes very, very high. It's got the highest point of a highway, I think, in, in the world. Uh, so that's a common route. So people do tend to come across here and then cross the Caspian Sea. We met quite a lot of cycle tourists that were doing this, this trip. Um, so yeah, when you're planning your route, consider your passport. Consider how much space you have in your passport. Um, that's a little note to myself. Um, my passport caused a bit of issue because I didn't, I, I ended up having enough pages, but um, do how Ellie did. Ellie had a big passport with lots of pages that weren't full. Uh, Brand think, new. Yeah. <laughs> uh, think about Ellie. I don't want to talk the whole lot. You're allowed to talk as well. Ellie. I don't want to. <laughs> it, uh, this is how this is how it goes. Dave's the front man. <laughs> I'm behind the scenes. <laughs> yeah, consider what your like your visa visa requirements as well. So, do to cross Kazakhstan, um, which is when well, which is th this one here. So, for on a British passport you get one month visa free entry. You can cross the border with nothing in your passport, one month visa free. To cross Kazakhstan will take probably about three months. So what we did is we skirted a little bit into Kyrgyzstan where you also get one month visa free and then back into Kazakhstan and then into Uzbekistan, which is another month and then back into Kazakhstan. So you can play this, you can play the borders a little bit and skip between countries. Um, in Thailand, how did Thailand work? Thailand's weird for jumping in and out of the borders, isn't it? Tha no, Thailand, you get um, a month, I think, visa free, don't you? And then you can extend. So you have to go to the visa office and you have to pay, I can't remember how much money. Mm. Um, but you can look all this stuff up anyway, depending on where you choose to go. Probably the most complicated place for visas is China. Yeah, we come but on to China later. We've got a slide about China. that. Yeah. So consider your passport. Uh, what what are the restrictions? What can you do? It is all online, usually on the government website of, of your own country and of the country you intend to go to. Consider the climate as well. This is one of the reasons we got, um, we decided to stay in Malaysia is because we were going too quickly and we would have entered China in winter. And China in winter is a very cold place to be. Um, so try to try to figure out how long you want to be in each country and what the climate is going to be like. Ideally, you want to be entering China. Um, what would you say, like April? I think there was like two points that seemed to make sense. And it was like just after winter and just as like summer is ending. Yeah. Or something like that. But I can't quite remember. But it just... You've got to be careful because the north of China is like freezing um, and it would, I don't know, some people maybe would like that. The thing is, is any climate is fine if you have the right gear, but it depends what you want. I mean, I personally don't like being cold, so I would not like to cycle in that weather. Yeah. Um, also, the west of China is desert, so be careful with that. That can get very hot and very cold um so yeah consider your climate what you want to do some people love it some people do snow cycling with huge tires and spikes on the tires and full gear so you can do it, it depends what you want to do the geography as well i love climbing the mountains i love it ellie's not quite as keen um so plan your route depending on what you want to do there's no point in crossing the pamir highway if you don't like to climb mountains you know, you might as well stick to the planes, keep low. Um, so that's another important thing. And also, it's not just about like going from A to B. It's about what you want to see along the way. So we made a point of going through Cambodia to see Angkor, Angkor Wat. Um, we took a bit of a detour in China to see um, Zhang Jiajie National Park, which is, uh, you'll know it from Avatar if you've seen that. Um, we took a trip to the canyon in Kazakhstan as well. That was a little detour that we enjoyed. So look at what you want to see. My advice for that is um, ask Ellie, because she, 
she'd sorted all this out. <laughs> <laughs> um, I think one thing though is just as you go, you always meet cycle other cycle tourists and other travellers. And honestly, I think in I wouldn't like to plan too far ahead because and just get too fixed on an idea because people will tell you all these things and you want to be able to sometimes just take that advice because it's great advice. I mean, they've just done it, so it's the best advice. Yeah, yeah, that's a very good point, yeah. Yeah, we didn't really ever plan much more than, I mean, a month in advance. We had a very loose plan by the end of that month, but generally it was like a week to two weeks was our immediate plan ahead. Um, and, yeah, you know, you can't plan too far ahead because you don't know what's going to happen, and also you might, get to like three or four people tell you you've got to go and see this so you know your plan should be fluid mm -hmm. but yeah ask people you meet along the way other travelers that are coming the opposite way um so um do you want to take this slide ellie oh it's just i added this one just because it's a few like just practical um uh, bits of advice just for like finding like specific routes um in different places like in europe there's all the eurovela routes which are amazing i think we'd uh, been navigating the whole way and then we got to europe and we just thought oh we'll just follow this route and then we just followed signs and along along cycle pathways rather than along horrible busy roads and it was lovely um yeah and then and there's so many of them as well. Um, and then Vietnam, that's that's a website which has like in the resources section, there's like um, different routes to take up through Vietnam and it's for motorbikes, but I mean, it's just as good for bikes. And in China, um, you can't use any maps that you would normally use. You have to use a Chinese map app, which is uh, really complicated. And, and yeah, obviously we don't, well, not obviously, but we don't speak Chinese. So um, I just had to learn where all the buttons were to use it and do a lot of like snap screenshots to do Google Translate. Um, and you can do it, it's a faff, but you have to use them. We ended up doing, is it a hundred kilometers detour because a road was yeah. broken because we yeah. followed Google Maps. Like do not follow Google Maps in China, it does not know. <laughs> um, yeah, and just mainly we used Maps Me and Google Maps. We downloaded all the offline maps along the way. Sorry. Yeah, Maps Me was very useful actually. Maps Me shows water points that Google doesn't show um, a, lot, a lot of the time. It doesn't show them all and some water points that appear don't actually exist, but rarely it's pretty, pretty good on it. Um, mm -hmm. The only thing about the maps me is when you when you uh, do your route as a cycling route, it will take you on all sorts of crazy adventures. Uh, so you need to be a bit savvy about that. Usually we would um, put a car route and a bicycle route and cross reference and see the smaller roads as well, um, avoiding the highways as much as we could. Yeah, yeah. yeah. That Euro Velo is fantastic, actually. It's great for cycling all Europe um, if you want to start off local. Um, and they crisscross all of all of Europe, really. We followed the Danube and the Rhine, and uh, it was all flat. It was beautiful cycling through mountains, but we were just along the river, of course, mm -hmm. so it was all flat. Great. Yeah. yeah, the longest one is 10,000 kilometers or something, I think, all the way from... Romania to oh no from Finland know, wasn't it Finland to the other side wherever that is yeah I think it was Bulgaria wasn't it on the border of Europe uh, yeah mm. yeah anyway, next one but yeah very easy to follow as well they're very well marked mm, not in Romania <laughs> <laughs> yeah that's true yeah. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. um, so we we came through China um, and China was fantastic the people are wonderful the scenery is stunning it's beautiful um, and camping is actually surprisingly easy I was surprised at how camp how easy it was to find camping wild camping uh, we wild camped most of the time um, but there are top five things that you need to know before you go to China um, and Ellie you, you put in this slide as well so if you want to take this one so you have to get a v if you go in most people go 
from west to east um, we just constantly went in the opposite direction to people um, we met one other pair of cyclists who were going the same way as us and that was it um, so we were fine because we could go we could get a visa in Vietnam and then um, it's it's cheap and it's easy and it's fine but from the other side we spoke to people and there was literally no way that they could have got a visa other than flying back to the UK so if you want to go to China that way you have to get a visa before you go um, probably most people know about the political situation in the west of China um, it is quite intense and I think um, just consider carefully if you want to cycle over it because you will go through a lot of checkpoints. Um, and it's, yeah, I think we, we heard it's not particularly enjoyable. We met a couple of people, didn't we, who said that they just gave up. Yeah. Because one, it's just desert, flat desert for like a thousand kilometers. And then two, you're just getting stopped every time. And it's very difficult to make even more than 50 kilometers in a day. Yeah. Yeah, and just like I said before, you've got to learn how to choose to use a Chinese map app. Um, and then you've got to download stuff before you go into China because you can't access most of the internet. You've got to download translations and a VPN. And then you can, well, if you've got a VPN, then you're all right. You can download everything else. Also, just about getting trains because we'd get some trains in China. Um, you have to book your trains early. Like we just thought, oh, we'll just go up to the train station and just get a train. <laughs> no, you have to get it early. Like, because there was no trains, was there? A couple of times we had to like mm -hmm. do some really windy routes. And also your bikes, they have to go like in cargo shipping. Um, so you have to ship them separately. And I think it took a week extra, didn't it? So it did, yeah, luckily certainly. we had just enough time in our visa. So yeah you've got to leave time you've got to yeah we were very lucky with that weren't we we were i think we had like two days to spare for the bikes because the bikes took seven days we took one day to arrive and the bikes took seven days yeah um yeah because yeah we had to do a few different trains what did you say ah the vpn as well just a free vpn works on your mobile like we didn't pay for our vpns um so if you if you want to pay, you'll get better service, better coverage. But we we were fine with the free freeware ones as well. Mm -hmm. Can I just ask? Is a, a VPN um, say if you get found with a VPN on your phone, there's no sort of uh, uh, I don't know laws or rules against that? No, I don't think there are actually. They're becoming more and more popular for mainland Chinese people, especially those who have gone out of the country. They've downloaded a VPN and they have it back in in their country. We did get told by a couple of people that were crossing the borders in China that the the border patrols took their phone and wanted to look at all the photos they had. Um, they didn't do that to us. I don't know if that's because we cr we crossed a brand new border that had just opened up like a few months before into Kazakhstan, because before going over into into Kyrgyzstan and I think the old border in Kazakhstan you couldn't cycle across the border. You had to get a bus or get a taxi. And yeah, we cycled with a Spanish couple for a while and they had to foot the cost of like $140, I think it was, to get a bus for the last hundred and so kilometers mm. to cross into Kyrgyzstan. But they did the Pamir Highway, this high highway that we were talking about before. So mm. I don't think there are any problems with having a VPN on your phone. Um, not that I heard. Mm. Yeah, um, I heard actually they, they, especially if you're coming through Xinjiang province, um, it's very militarized around there. The police are really heavy, like heavy presence of police. Um, so coming through there, they don't want you to take photos, obviously, of the camps that they have there, um, which we didn't see any of. Um, and they don't want you to take photos of bridges apparently and their infrastructure um anywhere but... i think people told they got all their photos deleted i was tempted to put a photo of a bridge up here actually in china just you know <laughs> you got away with it <laughs> yeah yeah i'm glad they didn't yeah the bridges are awesome there aren't they the construction is incredible yeah yeah moving on yeah 
Uh, so we're going to talk about the equipment, what stuff you should take, what stuff you don't need to take, but we took anyway. Um, yeah, talk about the bikes a little bit as well. So the bikes, people spend anywhere between, I don't know, what did Mario and Gemma spend? They, they got their bikes cheap, allegedly, and they spent like 1,500 euros on their bikes each. Yeah. Um, we didn't. Uh, I spent I think 150 quid. <laughs> all in, racks all as in. well. Yeah, handlebars and racks and seat and everything. Yeah, <laughs> yeah. So our bikes were just off the shelf. We added we added the luggage racks to carry everything, and we changed the handlebars. We use these type handlebars called butterfly bars, um, which gives you nice different varied positions how you can hold the the handlebar. A cross handlebar. I've done a cycle tour with a cross handlebar before, and it gets uncomfortable holding that same position all day long. So, a lot of people do it with drop handlebars, like a racing road bike, um, and that seems to work for people as well. Um, and some people just do it with the bull bars, with a straight one, but with just the bull bars coming up, um, and that works as well. You definitely just don't want a straight straight handlebar but also the takeaway from this is you don't need expensive equipment you don't need an expensive bike um the i think maybe the thing you do want to invest in is good bags good waterproof bags i'll come on to that in a bit as well um and also to distribute your weight it's good to have if you're doing a long tour i've done some shorter tours through europe with just the back loaded up and it was fine but if you're doing some extended tours, you really want to distribute your weight between the front and the back of the bike. It makes climbing up hills a lot easier. Um, so yeah, the bikes, spend what you want to spend. You don't have to spend a lot. Um, no, um, no, I had green tape. Oh no, wait, we did change, didn't we? Did we change handlebar tape? Julia just yeah. asked. We did, yeah. didn't we? I yeah. yeah, we did. Yeah, um, I think we the bars came with nothing. So yeah, you can see mine at the top here with just the green tape that you wrap around. And Ellie had the green. Um, and then I later on changed to this foam. It's just a foam tube you can get in, in cycle shops. You can get online as well. It's just a bit more padded. I preferred that. I thought it was a lot more comfortable, but Ellie, you were fine with the, just the normal tape, weren't you? The wrap tape. Yeah, I was fine, but I had cycling gloves, so you got the padding on your palm as well. Yeah. Mm -hmm. Yeah. Um, one thing I'll say about the bike, though, the frame, is make sure you have little, little um, bolt holes on the frame where you can actually fix your, your bike bags on, your racks onto... You'll, you'll, know, you'll know what I mean if you look at a bicycle, you'll have little bolt circle holes back down by the wheel um, on the forks here and not back on the frame. I loved having my basket. Um, it's well useful to just be able to throw something in a basket and as you're going along. Yeah, you Actually had a little really wicker useful. basket, didn't you, on the front? And everybody else, all the cycle tourists loved yeah. your basket. They had all these expensive yeah. waterproof baskets, yeah. but yeah, you used Yeah, I was fine. Properly. <laughs> yeah. So yeah, we mentioned the handlebars and the bull bars. Gears, the climbing gear makes such a difference. You want a, a bigger, like we were looking at changing Ellie's bike to increase the gears. The, the amount of gears at the back. Um, but the very nice man in the bike shop in Malaysia said, don't do that, that's too expensive. Do this, it's much cheaper. And it was the same amount of um, sprockets, uh, seven, was it eight? Eight speed, I think. Eight speed gears at the back, but the final gear at the back was a big gear. Uh, and that just makes climbing so much easier. You'll, you'll really be happy with it once you use it. So the wheels and tires, we were told um, that 26 inch rims, which is what you would normally find on like a standard mountain bike, that sort of size. Um, so really think about the rims as a mountain bike or as a road bike, like a racing bike. Racing bike will be 700C and 
the road, uh, the mountain bike, 26 inch. Um, we were told that it's difficult to find the tires and difficult to find replacement wheels for the 700. For the rims, actually, we found some difficulty in some places. Um, and in Turkey, it was a bit more difficult to find the right size tire. But generally, even in, even in Uzbekistan, even in um, places like more rural places, we were still finding the, the right tires and the rims for us. Um, There's bike shops everywhere, all over the world. And if you have a basic bike, then you can get your bike fixed anywhere. Yeah. You have these like complicated bikes with like fancy gears and fancy brake mechanisms, like people don't know how to fix them. That's right, yeah, Gemma, one of the Spanish ladies we were cycling with for a while, she couldn't get her brakes fixed because she had really high-end pneumatic brakes with blocks and nobody knew how to fix them, not even her. Uh, so, yeah, we that's another thing about buying just a standard off-the-rack bike. It's easy to fix it. You can find the parts everywhere, just normal V-brakes. Um, I was a bit worried about having disc brakes on the bike just because I was worried that we wouldn't be able to find parts, but that didn't seem to be a problem in all the bike shops we went to as well. So disc brakes is something that you can consider on the bike. Um, some people like to cycle with fat tires. They call it fat tires, they're ultra wide tires. Um, if you want to do a lot, of, a lot more off-road cycling, um, you want to be doing more of the dirt tracks. If you want to do the Pamir Highway, um, it's, people advise the wider the tire the better really because a lot of it is gravel and stone um, and lots of landslides and rocky paths so the fat tires if you want to do it we mostly stuck to um, stuck to roads paved roads smaller roads so we were fine with just the standard standard gauge we were using 700 700 by 38 um, which is pretty much a standard standard tire that you can buy in most bike shops nearly all bike shops um and spokes sometimes we had troubles with with um with finding new rims we had some rim problems um and sometimes the shops didn't have the right size spoke in or they didn't have the right size rim so carry some extra spokes with you learn how to use them um we carried extra spokes but we never actually used them but it's something to consider. Mm -hmm. And then the forks. Um, I use suspension on my front forks. Ellie didn't. To be honest with you, I didn't really need the front suspension a whole lot. So you don't need it. It's something you can have. But I'd suggest on my front suspension, it had a lock mechanism. So you could even either have it as springy or as solid frame. Most of the time I was on solid frame, so you don't need to invest a bit of extra money in front suspension. If you want it, you can have it. Um, measure your bike for your frame size. You know, there's any bike shop will, if you're looking to buy a bike, they'll tell you what size frame you need, or you can find online, you put in your height, and it tells you what frame size to get. If you just do a quick Google search, I don't know, six foot one, what bike frame size, it will come straight up. Um, and then your luggage racks. Luggage racks are the things that we, one of the things that we added onto the bike. This is a sort of selection. This one here at the top left, that's exactly like I carried on the front. Um, I couldn't quite remember yours, Ellie, but I think it's something like this one here. Yeah, I had some trouble with mine, didn't I? Yeah. What do you think the trouble was? I don't know. I can't, I can't remember that. <laughs> Useless fact. <laughs> yeah. Um, yeah. Try get something that covers the whole the whole fork. Um, I had no troubles at all with my front front pannier rack. This top here, this top one here, is a very common type design as well, which just hangs off the fork. Um, I'm saying this one here. Can you all actually see my mouse? Yeah. Yeah. All right. Good. Um, this one fixes to the fork and to the brake just here with this little attachment. Um, that was the problem. It fitted to the brake. 
Oh, that's right. And then yeah. I was having loads of trouble with the, the brakes and the rack. So don't get one that fits to the brake. No, I, I disagree because <laughs> mine fit to the brake and I had no problem. The problem oh. with yours was because <laughs> the bit of the rack that fits onto the brake was really wide. On mine, oh, it was know. just a thin piece of metal. It was a very thin piece of metal. So you could screw in the bolt that holds the brake in very easily. But on yours, it was a much chunkier piece of metal. Mm. Anyway, and, next yeah. page. Um, <laughs> so I just want to say a couple more things about the frames here. But um, <laughs> yeah, so if you're going for the front, go for the designs like this. Oh, this one looks amazing. I wish I had this frame. <laughs> this has got a little uh, table thing here. You can put extra, extra things onto. Um, but like this one here this frame here at the bottom middle it's not it's not worth anything it's it's useless you want something that's going to cover the whole of the wheel like this to stop the bike the bag from hitting into your wheel this one is not worth buying for a cycle tour if you just want to mill around town then this is fine but it needs to be something solid like this extra tubing and then th like this you can get these that fit just onto the seat post the problem with these is, I mean, it has this this uh, little guard here, which is good, but these can't carry a lot of weight. They're very reduced in the weight. We were carrying, altogether, I think we were carrying around 30 to 35 kilos of weight um, each on the bikes. These things can carry like, I don't know, seven kilos. So it's really not worth it. You need something that's gonna anchor to the frame and to the seat post. For the back rack, you want two points of anchor. Um, this is the brand that we use for our back racks, and they were fantastic, top peak. Um, I think it's the best rack you can get for the for the for the bikes, really, for the back rack. It's this one here. So about the bags, it's really important to keep everything dry as much as you can. You want waterproof panniers but really not with, not with a rain cover. Uh, the rain cover isn't, it's water resistant, not waterproof. Um, I've actually got my panniers here. Um, so this is my front pannier and it's not fully waterproof, but it was quite good. Um, but it had a rain cover over, but I wouldn't keep important things in this one. I would keep my important things in this one. Everyone has Art Liebs. Yeah, this is it. Art Lieb, it's really the, the best brand. Um, and one useful thing that this one has is a little pocket inside. It's good to have bags in bags, pockets, little zip pockets. Um, and these just roll over and they're 100% waterproof. Uh, you want it to clip easily on and off the bike. The nice thing about Artlieb is the handle, when you pull the handle, it pulls the lock here. So they lock on and then this, this bit here goes onto the frame as well. Uh, so zips, um, zips will break after use, after men, lots of time. So try not get bags with zips if you can um, on the outside at least um, and you want you want it to be stiff at the back this is hard back because that's going to rest up on the frame of the of the luggage rack if it's soft it's going to curl around and it's going to go into your into your wheels um, yeah what was it and value for money the thing is the art leaves they are expensive but they are going to last you many years. It's an investment. If you're buying cheap pannier bags, it's a bit of a false economy. However, having said that, Ellie had to get a pair of bags. What were your bags, were your bags in Vietnam considered expensive or cheap? In Vietnam, I think they were expensive, weren't they? Mm. They weren't that expensive, really. Yeah. They were like 70 quid for both of them, I think, about. Yeah. Which is really cheap. And they're really good. I still use them now. Yeah, but yeah, Artlieb really are the ones to go for. This one, Artlieb, and the one I've just shown you is this Roller Classic. I also had another one that was called Roller City, which I didn't like as much. It didn't have as much volume, um, 
and also this strap here you can use that as a shoulder strap to carry and it just makes life a lot easier so go for the classic over the over the city another brand that was actually very popular but we didn't try is this one vord um aqua seems to be the one that people are talking about um i can't vouch for it but we did see a lot of people cycling with them so i imagine it's a good brand as well mm. so like i said we we wild camped a lot of the time um have you got any tips, any top tips about finding a place to go and camp, Ellie? Um, no, really. I think you just, you, you need to, we often just camped quite, quite near, near the road, really, didn't we? Um, and you just look out for like trees or water or you know, just some, something that's going to hide you a little bit. Like in some places where there really wasn't very much countryside like oh there was just farmland or something we just camped at the edge of farm fields and um, like behind a hedge I don't we just camp anywhere really but also sometimes on like maps me or google you can actually just search camping and they will actually people have like put points um on the map of places they've camped just places they've wild camped yeah um, that was the one. what was the other one um I overlander as well yeah, and sometimes you just look at the map for like a green space or something, and that that works as well. Yeah, Google Satellite was useful. You can have a little idea, of a bit more of the terrain if you put it onto the satellite image. Mm -hmm. um, but yeah, like Ellie says, Maps Me is the one we used a lot, and people have put camping. It's open sourced Maps Me, so people put on their own camping spots and water sources. So that was useful. Um, we would if we saw somebody we would ask if it's okay to camp and nobody ever said no to us um uh but yeah like, like ellie says as well you just duck off the road a little bit you usually on a main road you'll find a little left turn or a right turn down a track and just at the edge of the road it's fine and at night time nobody nobody really sees you you know you're, you're, you're quite hidden yeah so i think um Everywhere we went, it's absolutely fine to wild camp. But then it's, when you get to Austria, it's the first country where it's illegal. And Austria and Germany we were advised, do not wild camp because um, if you get found, which you might apparently, um, you get like a thousand euro fine or something like that. So um, also in, I basically as soon as you get to like Western Europe, they don't like it. In Belgium, they have these things called pole camping or pal camp, um, and you can just go, you can just search it on a map, and they have like free campsites. You're not allowed to wild camp, but you can. They have these free campsites in woods, and it, they have like little um, what are they called? The compost toilets and everything. They're really lovely. Yeah, it's sort of like organized wild camping, isn't it? Yeah. Yeah. Uh, so this one here this one was taken in in china we were pretty miserable that day i remember because it was very cold um so i think i've got a slide about the tent later on um but if if you are camping just make sure that your tent is suitable for that those conditions this tent we bought it in vietnam because our original tent broke um and a few things that are very useful to have for a tent is like in this one, you want it freestanding. So you can put it on a hard surface. Um, the, the structure, the, the strength of the structure comes from the poles being hooked onto the, onto the fly net, onto the mosquito net. And also you want a separate mosquito net because this was taken in Thailand and it was just too hot to sleep in with the, with the sheet over the tent. Um, so we were sleeping a lot of the time with just the mosquito net. Uh, so they're top tips to consider. Your tent must be freestanding uh, and also a separate outer tent to inner tent. Mm -hmm. And also we had a tarpaulin with us, um, which just gave extra waterproof, extra waterproofing to the tent. Um, and was just very useful. And also we could string it up as, as a shade 
as well. Sometimes we would find ourselves in hot conditions with very little shade. So we string the tarp or use that. Um, mm. Yeah. Did you know you can cook a cake in an orange? <laughs> yeah. <laughs> There you go. It's Ellie's contribution there, yeah. Yeah, we all had cake in yeah. <laughs> Cut off the top of an orange, scoop it out, add a mixture of flour and sugar and, and water, was it? I don't know what else you... Bake mixture, yeah. Yeah, and then <laughs> whack it onto the coals. Mm. It's very tasty. Did it taste of orange? It did. Yeah. Orange cake. <laughs> <laughs> Um, yeah, so this is a, a regular setup as well. We had uh, a few fires. Uh, this is actually a stove, which I'll show you in a, in a couple of slides. Um, but we carried this pan, all compact. We had a stove um, that was made out of a drinks can, uh, and that fit inside with the, uh, the uh, what do you call it, a grippers and various other things. So everything for cooking fit inside this stove here uh, this pan here all packed down very neatly um yeah fires be careful about fires uh, obviously with dry ground you to be careful where you're lighting fires sometimes we decided not to make a fire because we didn't want to set the country on fire um but places like this we found it impossible to even start a fire so we weren't worried about setting anything alight there Um, so yeah, this is about the tent. Also about the seasons. Think about you'll when you're buying a tent, it will often tell you how many seasons it is. If it says two seasons, it's going to be for summer and spring, really. Um, three seasons, I guess. Ours was a two season, two to three season. Um, it was a bit shoddy. Our tent, the top didn't quite fit. It wasn't, you know, it was it was a cheap tent, but it did. Yeah. A, I would have liked a nice tent. Then. <laughs> yeah, yeah. Again, you can do things cheap, can't you? Yeah, but and sometimes it's not always the best choice. <laughs> yeah, exactly. Sometimes I really would have wanted a nicer tent. But then we met those. Do you remember that couple, the Australian guy and the Swiss lady? And they spent what did they spend like a thousand? No, not Something a thousand. They spent stupid. It was about a grand was for it a about tent, a grand? and it was rubbish. It was like falling apart, wasn't it? Yeah, <laughs> yeah. So, That's another thing. You sometimes see tents, and all the pole structure is one with a little dome on the top, and you just open it out of the bag. But people were having troubles with those tents. You just want a normal, simple. Just keep your equipment simple, simple and functional. But yeah, obviously, if you want to do some snow cycling, you're going to want a four-season tent. Uh, Freestanding is a must. And the mosquito net we've talked about. Sleeping bags. My sleeping bag was inadequate for some of the journey. I was suffering. Mm -hmm. um, Me too. Yeah. <laughs> if, you're, if you're going into, even into autumn, autumn temperatures, early spring temperatures, you want a good sleeping bag. Mm-hmm. Um, we carried extra blankets and sheets. Um, a use, a very useful thing was um, just, I have it here, just bear with me. Just a piece of material, just a, a piece of cloth, like two meters by two meters or whatever. And it's very useful. It really does add an extra layer of insulation. Um, when sometimes we found ourselves um, offered a bed and it was a dirty, scratty horrible looking type of bed we would lay the sheet over the top of it so we were on something at least slightly clean um, an extra blanket can be useful as well if you've got the space for it i really was happy to have my blanket along the way um pajamas i don't know i just slept in a t-shirt or a shirt i had a shirt for sleeping in ellie had um full pajama set nighty <laughs> yeah and the sleeping mat so my sleeping mat was just a standard rolling like you see the foam roll mat thing um but ellie liked a bit more luxury yeah you can get like thin blow up ones like they blow up like to that or something and they're good and they don't take up any space at all and they're, they're pretty light actually i i in hindsight i should have got one myself but i was too stubborn too stubborn and too proud to get one um <laughs> Just come back, actually, this is, this is the tarp, so it packs down very small, weighs very little, 
Um, and then we took a separate ground sheet as well, um, which also packs down very small and weighs, weighs nothing. Um, that, that's useful uh, even just to, to have your picnic on in the afternoon rather than onto the, if it was dusty ground like in the desert, it was nice to spread the ground mat out. Or if it was slightly wet underfoot, set the ground mat out and we can stay dry that way. So while camping, we took to, talked a little bit about that. Sorry about that there. Um, that's uh, meant to say water sources and people and animals here. Um, so we talked about most of this. Beaches, to sleep on a beach is a much more romantic and nice idea than it actually is in practice. Beaches just get sandy. Um, if you can find a beach with maybe some sort of grassy area around it, camp on the grassy area. It is nice to sleep on beaches, um, but sometimes, especially when it gets windy or if it rains, then the beach is a much less nice place to be. It's horrible. Just <laughs> say how it is, Dave. <laughs> yeah. I was just thinking about the one in the one in Turkey, actually, where we saw the dolphins. That was a beautiful oh, okay. place to sleep Yeah, on. but we didn't sleep on the sand. If you can go, like, if there's a bit of beach... And you can sleep on the grassy bit before you get to the sand, then that's all right. Did we not sleep on the sand? No, you're right. Huh? Yeah, yeah, we slept under the trees there. Yeah, yeah. Try avoid sleeping camping on sand. Um, and then yeah, some alternatives to wild camping. Um, what is this? So temples, temples and mosques. Um, the mosques were usually very accommodating in Southeast Asia, in Indonesia especially. And then the temples, Thailand is a dream to cycle to. If you want a nice, easy place to cycle to, uh, that's a bit more exotic than Europe, Thailand is definitely the place to go for a first time cycle. There are temples everywhere. And if you go and ask permission, they will let you sleep in the ground. So we slept, set the tent up. Sometimes they gave us a room so we could set the tent up in a, uh, in a room with a proper roof. One time the, they gave us like a cooking hob so we could cook some food on. And they always give, they'll always give you some food, always biscuits and instant noodles. Eh? <laughs> um, we made a point as well of before we would sleep in a temple, we made a point of buying some fruit um, to give us an offering to, to, the, to the monks in the morning. Um, they have some rules about eating, the monks do. Um, they can't cook for themselves. Um, so try avoid giving them instant noodles. I think that's why we were given so many instant noodles because they, they can't cook them. Um, but yeah, we always offered a bit of fruit. It's just a nice thing to do. But yeah, Thailand is a dream. The drivers are friendly, nice. It's very cheap. Uh, the food is very cheap. Um, the best place and then warm showers you've probably heard of couch surfing so warm showers is like couch surfing this is another typo here sorry about this it's warm showers i know it's dot org ah, that's where the g is here no. um so it's like a platform for cycle tourists to find hosts and these people are often cycle tourists themselves and it's I don't know if it's still free, actually, um, or it's not. It's still free. And we did hosting as well in KL. It's always nice to be both, I think. Yeah. yeah. Dave, just so you know, it's five to seven. Yeah, it's okay if we run over a little bit. <laughs> okay. Apparently. Isn't it, Chris? <laughs> yeah, yeah. I try not to go too long, but yeah. Um, yeah. It, it's, we're still, well, I think most of us are still engaged, at least. So. Yeah, all right. Um and yeah, in, in um, Central Asia, especially the kindness of people, people were always inviting us to come and sleep in their houses. Um, they're just yeah. so hospitable. And hostels as well. Yeah, yeah, hostels yeah. and hotels if we need it. We struggled hostels. to wild camp in Vietnam, didn't we? Yeah, we did. Hostels are nice as well in some places because you do meet um, a lot of people and it's really enjoyable. Mm. Um, especially in Central Asia, right? We met loads and loads of cycle tourists in Central Asia in hostels. It was really fun. Yeah. We took <laughs> over a whole room at one point, didn't we? And then we spilled yeah. over into another room. <laughs> yeah, I think there was about 10 cycle tourists in one hostel at one yeah, point. Yeah, it was great. All righty. Uh, why can't I move on? Uh, here we go. 
yeah so this was another alternative to camping is uh, work away um we worked with uh, in on an organic farm with i've got a photo of him on another slide actually later but we were building ovens in in this place here it was all mud mud brick buildings around this steel frame this was the the main living room of this building you can see how big it is it was amazing it was amazing yeah. um and yeah we were just building. out in the garden working like weeding and tending to the chickens and build we built a fence and helped build bricks to to make some more of this structure here um we met all these lovely people at that place as well here's the guy who had the place at the back there mm -hmm. and then we worked at this hostel for a bit as well which was a actually a sweet deal after another one fell through so yeah you can find all sorts all sorts of work there's other sites as well you, you might be familiar with another site called woofing working on organic farms i think it stands for um and there's another one called help x uh help exchange uh all the same sort of idea woofing is just farms but this work away is all sorts hostels and in in vietnam we did another one with a, a guy who'd set up a disabled charity but he actually just wanted Dave to teach him English. Pretty much. We were slightly misled with that one. We? Um, what, what were you doing with the children in that photo? Uh, they were showing me some magic tricks, actually. <laughs> I love these guys. They were amazing. They were doing all sorts of tricks. They taught me magic tricks and I taught them magic tricks. We did a circus workshop, though, didn't we, for all the home ed kids? Yeah, we did. Yeah. yeah. I think that was the same day, actually, wasn't it? Yeah, yeah. Yeah, so this guy, this guy was also very friendly with uh, a lot of the home ed people, and this lady here was um, the the matriarch of the family. So yeah, we did a workshop for for them one day. It was great fun. Mm, it was. So these are some things that you absolutely essentially need if you're doing long touring: a water filter. This is the one we use. It's gravity flow. Um, very quick water filter. You have to be quite careful with them because they damage easily. Um, but yeah, water filter is essential if you're in, especially in Southeast Asia, I think we used it most. Yeah, and actually on reflection, uh, we should have used it in Turkey because I got really ill. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> yeah, we maybe got a bit complacent. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. yeah, but I researched this. I did geek out on this a little bit. Um, because we got one initially that was terrible and you had to pump it and it took about 10 minutes to get them out a litre. Um, so these ones, you literally just hang it up and it just works and it's amazing. Um, you need a lot of water for cycling. Um, we, would, we would probably filter like 10 litres a day or something, wouldn't we? Mm. Um, so, you know, you really do need a lot of water. So you need something that's going to do large amounts of water in not too much time. <laughs> and that one is great. Yeah, it is. It really is. Yeah. It's amazing how fast it is, actually. Yeah. Um, so this is the stove that we had. Um, that I told you about before. We made it out of a drinks can, um, and it burns like surgical alcohol, eighty percent proof and up. Um, the benefit is it's very very light, um, and you can buy alcohol generally anywhere um, in the pharmacies or the hardware stores. The problem is. If the temperature is low, it can be hard to ignite. And also it doesn't work so well at higher altitudes. Uh, so just be aware of that. A lot of people were carrying, starting to carry this stove here um, and it burns everything, even petrol. Um, it works with a pump. I don't quite know how it works. It's very technical. It's too advanced for me. Um, but we, we met a few people who had them and two of the people said that they were having troubles with it, that they'd broken, they were very delicate and that it was impossible to find the parts to fix them on their travels. So they had to order online and pay shipping costs and it turned out quite expensive for them. So they are useful, but not, not, so, not so robust. Um, we didn't want to take one of these normal gas canister color gas type things because we were unsure if we would find the canisters in in the world you know in other countries but i think it wasn't actually a problem the irish guy that we met there um that young lad who'd cycled he was using one of those and 
yeah. he hadn't found any troubles at all with it. So you can use a normal camping stove as well. Mm -hmm. um, if you want to make something like this, look on YouTube. They're all over putting drinks can stove, drinks can camping stove. It's a useful thing to know as a backup if your stove does fail. The Spanish guys that we were cycling with had one of these that had broken and then they started using this one. Um, the solar panel, very useful. That turned out to be really very useful for us. Yeah, it did. Yeah, it was great. You can charge anything. As long as you've got USB, you can charge anything on them. And they're, they're really quick as well. Like, I think if it's sunny, it'll charge just as fast as you plug it into the wall. Yeah. Mm. Um, you, you do want to get one of these folding ones because we had some small ones that were just like this, a power pack, and they weren't worth the weight. Yeah. Uh, they just didn't work. Um, but you don't need to, they're not expensive. What was it, about 50 quid hours? 30 quid. 30 quid, yeah. yeah. So they're not expensive. You can find them cheap and they're very useful. And mm. also your head torch, a red light. A red light is very, very useful. Um, Make sure it's annoyed, it Dave. Yeah, you just, <laughs> just have a white away. light <laughs> shining in his face all the time. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> Red and white light, you keep your night vision and it's much um, much less intrusive, you know, like you you will need to leave the tent to go and urinate and you don't want to be blinding yourself at 2 a.m. with a white light. The red light is the way. So this one is, uh, is mine. It has a red and a white light. Uh, so yeah, these are little things, power bank. I didn't animate these two, obviously. I'm just going to breeze through these and let you take a screenshot, actually, because we've talked about most of it. Um, this in... is recorded as well, so we can go back to it as well in the future. Ah, great, yeah. It'll be up on YouTube eventually. Okay. Oh, uh, this is very useful, actually. Leak-proof food storage, tubs, Tupperware. Yeah, because you can store your food, you can eat out of it. They're very useful. Hmm. Surprisingly useful. Yeah, the travel bank card is useful until I lose it. Uh, that was a very bad mistake on my part. That nearly ended the journey. Uh, but yeah, take one of these because it means you can get money out without paying. Um, was it you don't pay transfer charge or bank charges? Yeah, you don't pay, yeah, the charges, the withdrawal charges. What was what you use, Caxton? Yeah, I mean, there's loads of them. Yeah, I've heard Monzo is good. Mm. No. Yeah. So I don't know, whatever research. I'm not good at research and stuff like that. <laughs> so your VPN, <laughs> um, again, anything online free uh, from iStore or Play Store, whatever it is. Um, the cotton cloth, a chair. Ellie, Ellie was desperate for a chair, for a little camping chair. I would have loved a chair. And then the people that we cycled with for a couple of months had chairs and I was just the most jealous person I've ever been in my life. <laughs> I like the ground meat. <laughs> Compass is useful to carry. We used it a few times when, when we were unsure of the maps. A fan, Ellie had a little fan and that was glorious some nights in, in the tent. The tents can get very, very hot. So I'd plug it into the power bank and then hang it off the ceiling, and it was amazing. Yeah. <laughs> Take a book with you, or a Kindle, a uh, hot water bottle if you want. That would have been nice in some parts. That's one on reflection in it. I would have yeah. loved a hot water bottle. Yeah. Your GPS on your phone is fine, and a first aid kit, obviously. Um, string and knife. You won't believe how useful a string and a pen knife is. Something like this, a little Swiss Army knife. My bicycle was held together by a string at the end. There. Yeah, there's a lot of string on your bike <laughs> at the end. Um, cups and bowls. Um, so I'm using my cycling cup, actually. These we found with a little lid. It's brilliant. We would make oats. We would set some oats in a cup and pour water on and then put the lid on. And in the morning, we've got fresh oats to eat without cooking. Um, pen and paper for your entertainment and a buff something like this very useful for the on top of your head maybe or um, for the dusty roads um, to stop you swallowing all that dirty horrible dust uh, lots of sun cream and 
bungee cords. Bungee cords, you need you need lots of bungee cords. You won't realize how many bungee cords you need until you start using them. They're very, very useful. Um, so, uh, gaffer about, tape. <laughs> and gaffer tape. Yeah, this is another one, a bit of gaffer tape. This is the bag that broke, Ellie's bag. Running repairs. You don't need to carry a whole lot of tools and a whole lot of repairs, uh, repair kit. Um, I had a major problem with my wheel here. You can see the rim split. Um, this doesn't happen if you're using disc brakes. So that's one thing to consider about the brakes. Um, try to keep it nice and clean. Um, this was from one day cycle. I think I cleaned it the day before as well, annoyingly. Um, <laughs> but yeah, generally your, your repairs, you're not going to change a whole lot apart from your brake blocks. Um, maybe your cables, your, your cables, but it's easy jobs. Um, you want a multi-tool, um, which I don't actually have on me at the minute. Um, you want a multi-tool with some spanners and Allen keys. Um, but generally, you don't need to carry a whole lot of repair equipment. The, your wheel's going to go. You, you're not going to carry a spare wheel. Carry a spare tire and carry some spare inner tubes. Generally, two spare inner tubes is, is a good thing to carry. So then you don't have to just repair a puncture every time you can just put a new inner tube on and then later that night you can you can repair the punctures in the inner tubes learn basic bicycle maintenance before you go um it will make life a lot easier but you don't need to know how to strip down a bicycle and build it back up again i'll take someone who does know <laughs> yeah <laughs> ellie was the planner and i was the mechanic that's how it worked we were a great team <laughs> Uh, so yeah, this is what I've just said pretty much. Adjustable spanner was useful as well. An extra like, what do they call it? A mo monkey wrench or something, an adjustable spanner. Um, your cables, inner tubes, and a puncture repair kit. Make sure you've got a puncture repair kit. <laughs> yeah, string and gaffer tape. Uh, so these are some questions that we were asked quite a lot, um, but, uh, I don't know. Uh, you can ask these at the end as well if you want. Um, communicate. Google Translate is useful. Um, eat what you like. Money. You can exchange your money along the way. As you get into a new country, the next town will have generally have money exchange and banks. Um, people are amazing all over the world. Ellie, is it difficult for a woman to do this? <laughs> Honestly, people... Yeah, I think it's one thing as a, as a woman you have to get used to a little bit when you travel in to different parts of the world. And I know it's it would be nice to say that it doesn't happen, but it definitely happens. Um, people just have this certain attitude towards women, and um, I, it, it's just how it is. Like you're not going to change the world. Um, but yeah, people think you're a bit weak, and I had men trying to take my bicycle off me and. You know, carry my bags and um, just just telling me that I couldn't possibly do that because you're a woman and, and things like that. Quite a lot, wasn't it? I lost my rag with a guy one time because he said, "No, she can't do this." She because we were climbing up a hill. Um, Ellie was a bit behind me, and this guy was like, "She can't do it. She can't do it. She's weak." And I was like, Pfft. "Listen here, young man, old man, even." <laughs> It's like, this lady has cycled from Malaysia, you know? She's coming up this hill. You're on a motorbike. She's stronger than you. I can't see you doing this. I was um, tempted to let him try, actually. It would have been yeah, hilarious. Yeah, it would have been great. Yeah. <laughs> um, the best country to cycle in, I'd say, was Thailand for, uh, like, for ease. But one of my favorite countries to cycle was Georgia. Um, just the scenery is beautiful. If you like climbing mountains, Georgia's the place to go. Um, your best country to cycle, Ellie? Uh, it's a really difficult question, but I did really like Georgia. Um, Georgia, Turkey. Um, where else? Thailand, Vietnam. Yeah, yeah Vietnam is beautiful. <laughs> yeah, all of the above. Um, <laughs> Azerbaijan? Yeah. I don't Sorry. know, Very basically. Nice, yeah. 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 <laughs> Uh, vegetarian food is easy to find everywhere. Don't be, don't be shocked. I was surprised at China. Actually, I thought we were going to have to start eating pork again in China, but 
it was very easy once we had the translation down and um, we could point at things very easily. We learned the phrases, no meat, I don't eat meat, I don't eat fish um, in every language before we arrived. Um, we, could, we could say about five things in every language at least, couldn't we? Yeah, basic. Yeah. I am vegetarian. Hello. <laughs> yeah. Can we cab here? <laughs> another one, another very useful one was two of these again, please. <laughs> um, yeah, dangerous place to cycle. Vietnam's roads, I guess. Vietnam. Yeah, Lobbies. the roads are hectic. And also the road coming into Bangkok, possibly the, the worst road. Um, best food was in Georgia. Malaysia was pretty bad as well, yeah. Yeah. Um, yeah. And are we married? We were asked that all the no. time. <laughs> no. Um, to stop all the questions, we told everybody we were brother and sister. And that helped everything. Because a lot of the world can't understand that a man and a woman can travel and not be married and not have children. Are you married and do you have children? And why don't you have children? <laughs> yeah. Why aren't you married? <laughs> yeah, yeah. Brother and sister. Um, yeah. Uh, so we're near, we are nearly, nearly done. Uh, so the people... You know, the people are what make the journey. This is the guy in Thailand that had the, the mud house. Um, and she was doing pretty much exactly the same journey we were doing, but in reverse. She was ending in KL and she'd cycled from Durham. Yeah. Um, and then friend, you've got friends all over the world. These are all people that we, we knew before. So in, in China, we met these people in Vietnam, in Turkey, they get an honorable mention. Um, this is Ellie's sister over in um, in Holland, and Ellie's mum down here. Um, this guy in Belgium, this lady in Turkey. This guy, just honourable mention as well. This guy was walking across China. Oh yeah, yeah. This lady here in Serbia. <laughs> this lady in Hungary. These people in Kazakhstan. They're just people we knew, and this guy in Germany as well. Uh, so just get on Facebook. Say, who do I know in Germany? And people will reply. Um, and yeah, rest. Have fun and rest. It's not yeah. all about just cycling. It's not all about going for it, you know. Drink lots of coffee. Have tea with the, with the officials. <laughs> um, these cafes, these are a hammock cafes in Vietnam. I think Vietnam is the most civilized country. You can Coffee go and hammocks. In a hammock in a cafe. It's amazing. It's instead of a service station. Yeah. <laughs> it's amazing. Yeah. And yeah. then also, in, if you ever go to Uzbekistan, you've got to try their, um, try their wine. It's fine. Yeah. And yeah. And I think sometimes we would just, if we found a really, really nice camping spot, you know, we would just stay another night. If we had enough food and drink and whatever else we wanted. Yeah, I think I nice. put one. Yeah. No, I didn't. There was one camping spot that we stayed for a few nights, actually. Yeah. 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 Enjoy the scenery. Um, meet the locals. So, yeah, that was it. Sorry, it overran slightly there. Um, there's a question here in chat, I think. Thank you for coming. No. Okay. Very good. So, um, that's the Instagram. That's the blog that will get finished eventually it's over a year now Ellie. it's over a year that we've been back and it's still not finished blogs on you <laughs> yeah i know the blogs on me it will get done maybe next year so, I, remember uh, when, I remember when you came to visit me when you'd arrived and said right i'm going to do just the last few days of this blog now and that was when you visited me <laughs> it's never gonna happen <laughs> <laughs> it will it will eventually <laughs> so maybe yeah. we covered it all maybe there's no questions yeah answered all the questions did you train like how long did you train for that or did you train at all or do you just pack your bags and go <laughs> uh yeah we didn't train we yeah. just figured you just start and then you go as far as you can and then you'll get better every day so you know train on the job but, you know, a lot of people do train and it's not a bad thing uh, to do. I mean, it's just how you feel about it, really. But I think the point is that you can do it without training because you can get somewhere by doing 50 kilometers a day if, if you want or 20 kilometers a day. It'll just take you a bit longer. Um, 
just what yeah i think um i ended up with a bit of an overuse injury on my knee because of um not having the right saddle height i just thought of that um really like um i can't stress that enough like getting the right saddle height is so important um so yeah go and ask at a bike shop if you're not sure yeah. yeah, I'd say about the about the training as well. I know when we first set off from Indonesia, um, Ellie Ellie was uh, Ellie said to me like, "Well, we'll we'll see what we can do. Yeah, maybe we'll do like um, like forty or fifty kilometers in a day in the beginning, and then we'll build up." Um, and I was like, "No, that's that's nothing." And she says, "No, but it's it's a lot. Fifty kilometers. I think on the first day we actually did like eighty kilometers." quite quite happily yeah. yeah and we ended up in that english yeah. village yeah yeah so yeah you you train along the way we met a few people who just got on their bike and and went and then a few people who were doing like who were athletes already and were cycle they'd cycled them guys had cycled from italy to kazakhstan in like, yeah, like a month or something. Days or something. <laughs> yeah. yeah so I you mean, don't need to train do it different ways you know some people do it as like a fitness test don't they and some people do it just because they want to go and see the world so we met one lady who had retired um and she was a climber and she had arthritis she couldn't climb anymore so she was like right i'm off on my bike and she had no plan she just got on a bike and set off cycling and we met her coming down south in vietnam and we were heading north and she was like no it's too wet it's too raining up there i'm coming back down south it's nice weather down there <laughs> Yeah, so to take it your own and another thing is people would always say to me like oh i could never do such a thing and i say well you could you just maybe can't do it in the same time but like ellie says if you're doing like 50 kilometers a day eventually you'll get to where you're going if you're doing 20 kilometers a day eventually you'll get there It'll take you a while but you'll, yeah. get there. <laughs> yeah, you'll get there when you when you uh question to both of you when you got back did you feel a that you wanted to get back on your bike again or b that you never wanted to see your bike ever again <laughs> i never wanted to see my bike ever again <laughs> my bum was so sore <laughs> i wanted to get back up north back to back to scotland to see my mum um mum hi mum <laughs> um uh raid the fridge get some nice cooked food then get off my bike again i was raring yeah i've still got to see south america yet i could have carried on <laughs> i think we both could have carried on physically by then um but you know it was we've both been out of the uk for so long as well uh like i'd been out of the uk for about four and a half years and you've been out for about three and a half years or so um so we were just ready to be back home again as well yeah i've got an electric bike now so that says it all really doesn't it <laughs> i've done my bit <laughs> oh i i still cry myself to sleep at that thought it's amazing <laughs> i've had so many people get in them recently um yeah and they're swearing by them yeah the thing is like an electric bike it, um it, you still have to work but you can go for longer uh, for the same amount of effort, which I think as a Taurus is probably quite a good thing. We actually met a few people that had batteries fitted to their bikes. Um, the Italians uh, who were who'd done that in 28 days, they were they were actually their their journey was to go and ski. I think they were skiing like seven, five or seven mountains on their journey. So they were carrying skis like full ski equipment as well um and they had these trailers that had a big um a solar panel on the back mm. that drove a battery so they say that's the reason they could make it so so quickly and then we met some french cyclists as well who were just they were ex extreme in all the wrong ways i think they were oh your sound's gone how about that yeah, that's okay. um, yeah, they were carrying just extreme equipment because they could. They had these huge trailers. <coughs> I remember hearing a cycle tourist say one time, um, it was actually my mum who sent me off on this journey, really, because she got the, got me a book of a guy who'd cycled uh, around the world. And the bike, this was sort of like the justification, the bike, the title of the book was 
world cycle touring anyone can do it and i thought that was my green light from mum i could do it <laughs> i'm allowed um so th this guy said in the book like the more bags you take like you've got the back bags the front bags your basket the things on the back the more you take the more bags you take the more capacity the more stuff you'll take um and you you realize that you, you you pack a lot of stuff but you don't need to take so much stuff really um so it's a bit of a trade-off. These guys, these French guys, were, they had a tent. I could stand up in the tent. I'm 6'1", and I could stand up inside it. For two people, it's, it's unnecessary. Um, yeah, just, I, 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 I went off on one there. Yeah, it was about bikes, batteries, yeah. <laughs> no, but Ellie is fully justified in having her electric bike, actually. For, yeah, I am. Uh, it done takes another car off the road. <laughs> yeah, no, I think I make, I, I make it sound negative. Like, I'm so glad I did it, and I would definitely do shorter trips again. Um, We're going to go back and do the Pamiers one day anyway, aren't we? That is, that is a, the plan. That is the plan. We we got a question uh, from Jolly there saying, um, yeah. "What was your what was your, what did you find most challenging, and what was the best time of the trip?" For me, the most challenging. I think I got really sick in Turkey because I didn't drink the right water, probably, um, and it's really not very nice when you get sick. Um, and just cycling up and down hills when you're not feeling well is is not pleasant, and. But also that was really amazing, wasn't it? Because we met these people who just took us in when I was just really, really ill. <laughs> and um, Both times, wasn't it? Eh? Yeah, like both times it happened, too. yeah. Mm -hmm. So, you know, you're just like, wow, like people are just so <laughs> kind. Um, so yeah, that was probably the most challenging for me. The, the best time, um, the best time, I don't, maybe like, it was really fun when we started cycling with the, the Spanish couple that we cycled with for a while. And then um, we had some little bicycle discos and uh, going through Georgia and uh, I don't know, just, yeah, just that was fun, wasn't it, cycling with those guys? Yeah, it was, yeah. Yeah, um, yeah I, I think, you know, going downhill is also one of the best moments you know it's so much better to go downhill on a bicycle than on a on a motorbike for example um so that was one of the the main highlights for me Just, and the scenery you know like there's one image that stays with me in in china of the you know you see like the watercolor paintings of china with the mist in the mountains we saw it for real that was really a highlight for me it was on the china page yeah yeah, it's in. Yeah, yeah it's that, that yeah. scene that was just mm. fantastic. I'm actually just while I talk, I was trying to search for the bicycle disco picture. I should have put it in. I can't believe I didn't. Um, the worst time for me, I don't know if I had many, many a worst time. I remember. Yeah, I, I, do you know the wind? The wind was really. Oh yeah. <laughs> very bad. It was brutal sometimes um in in where was it in kazakhstan you know we would do it it was easier to just get off and push uh it was awful it was soul destroying you know you just couldn't go anywhere that was that was the worst like a, a headwind the wind always was against us always it's unbelievable yeah so if you cycle um i think if you cycle west to east then um, you're less likely to be against the wind the whole way. Yeah, you've got the prevailing wind with you, haven't you? Yeah. That's why most people do it, I guess. Mm. But we had the wind against us. I remember even as well, we went for New Year's, we, we met up with some people, with some of our friends um, at New Year's. Um, and so we we had to we we had a bit of time to kill so we overshot to the next city which was a bit cheaper and then we were going to come back another 40 kilometers like backtrack and we had the wind against us going up past the town and then we thought well it's all right because we'll have finally have the wind with us going going backtracking um and then the day we went, the wind had changed, so it was against us anyway. And obviously, the day that we left that town to carry on going north, the wind changed again. <laughs> oh, it was depressing. It was. 
Oh. Here's the bicycle disco. <laughs> <laughs> we fancy dressed it and everything. Uh, there you go. That's a good way to uh, end it. Isn't it? Yeah. <laughs> Have fun. Have bicycle discos. <laughs> yeah, we stayed in that camping spot for a few days, didn't we? Three days, I think. Yeah, we all did. All. We made a barbecue and and everything. Yeah. <laughs> yeah, we we got. We actually got quite drunk. We didn't drink a whole lot on the journey, did we? But we did get drunk that day and we got drunk a lot in Georgia as well. Not that Transition Sterling condones drinking in any way, shape or form. <laughs> um, <laughs> I'm drinking tea. <laughs> Good. Uh, so I've just put another couple of links in there as well. A link to Transition Sterling's website. You can have a look at um, various other events and things that we've been doing and a little bit more about us. And then there's also a link in there, which I, I will send out in an email as well. I wonder if Ellie and Dave would be happy to compile a list of all the sites and things that you've mentioned throughout, and I can distribute that to people. Sure. Um, but there's a link there to an um, uh, uh, illustrated climate um, uh, 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 e-learning resource, um, which uh, has a section specifically on transport. So check that out, have a look. There's a section on transport, lifestyle, food, and energy. So have, have a look at them as well. You can log in as guests. You don't need login credentials. So, so have a look at that. Um, hopefully you've all had a, a go at the quiz that I sent out as well. Um, if you haven't, check your emails. Um, just for fun quiz there. Um, and I think that, that just leaves us to say thank you very much for David and Ellie for, for um, presenting that. Like I said before, this is going to be up on YouTube. So uh, ho hopefully that will be up there soon enough with it within a week or so. Um, so have a look out for, for that too. Um, check us out on Facebook, Instagram, Twitter, all the regular social medias. Um, on the feedback form, you've got an option to join our mailing list and also be a member of Transition Sterling. Um, and check out Wheelie Far as well, the blog that David and Ellie did along the way. It, it really is a good read. There's some, there's some rather dubious pictures and photos in there along the way, but there's some, uh, some cracking stories and, and you see it really in depth. and. Uh, Everyone email Dave to get him to finish it as well. It's hard <laughs> to finish it. I'll do it tomorrow. <laughs> cool. Okay. Well, well, thank you all for for joining us, and have a have a good evening, and we'll um, we'll, we'll see you see you in on.